We're back with the Hammer Podcast. Podcast. That's right, friends. The moment you've all been waiting for. We're back in the saddle with half our theological brains tied behind our back just to give the Arminians a fighting chance. So as we dive right in, last week we were talking about amillennialism. Um, and so we're going to pick up right from there, but maybe you want to do a short recap for us? Yeah, yeah. So we mentioned last time that the amillennial approach to the book of Revelation is to see it as a series of recapitulations of the inter-advent age, right? Otherwise known as the church age, but between Christ's first and second coming. And I mentioned G.K. Beale, B-A-E-L-E. Good as, old Beale. That's right, as a uh, one example of an amillennial scholar uh, who's written extensively on this. But Beale and others uh, set forth seven such cycles of recapitulation in the book of Revelation, with Revelation 20 beginning the seventh and last such recapitulation. Hence, when you read Revelation 20, you are reading something that is recapitulating, that is summarizing the entire church age between Jesus' first and second coming. All right, that's what they will posit. That's what an amillennialist will typically put forth, as noted last week. Uh, and this is true with postmillennial. Premillennial, amillennial, right? You 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 have different nuances, right? Among uh, some of uh, those in those camps, so we certainly want to point that out. But typically, uh, they will see seven such cycles of recapitulation, but they certainly all will see Revelation twenty as recapitulating uh, church history. So it's giving you a uh, kind of a summary of the entire time period between Christ's first and second coming, which, which of course, we're still in. Right, right. And uh, therefore, the thousand-year period is happening now. Right. Right, between Christ's first and second coming. And you say, well, wait a minute, it's been more than 2,000 years already. And again, they'll say, well, 1,000 doesn't need to be taken. Right. Literally, it just means a long time period. So that kind of summarizes a little bit of where we were last week. Yeah, and you had said that you wanted to say a word or two about specifically Revelation chapter 20 and the chapter divisions. Right, yeah. So sometimes we can get so bogged down when we begin to think about things uh, theologically and we begin to dig deeper that we sometimes have to come back up to the surface, maybe. Yeah, you're so, looking at the bark so much right. detail you forget you're in a forest of redwoods. That's right. Oh, boy, you went deep on that illustration, but that's I like That's right, it. that's right. Yeah, so look. Uh, two things here, really. First, remember there were no chapter divisions and verses originally in Scripture, right? Wait, wait, what? What? Yes, <laughs> a newsflash. Yeah, yeah, newsflash. Uh, it yeah. was, if memory serves me correctly, somewhere about early 13th century that divisions, chapter divisions and verses as we know them uh, began to be used. And I think you're looking at 1380-ish, 1382, somewhere right around there, that right, the Wycliffe English Bible was the first one to use the chapter divisions and verses that we are aware of, okay? Right. So here's my point. If we had John's original copy of the book of Revelation, and we're reading through it, we would not have chapters and verses, okay? So what we know as Revelation chapter 20, verse 1, might begin a new paragraph, but it would not be known, it, it would not be chapter 20, verse 1, right? We would not look at a papyri, and see chapter 20, verse 1, written on there. Okay, so we have to ask ourselves this. What is it, or is there anything in what we know as Revelation chapter 20, verse 1, that would alert us to the fact that what is being said is not sequential to what was just said at the end of what we know as chapter 19, Okay and therefore should be taken as something other than following what has just been said time-wise? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. So, you know, taking all of this into account... Sure. ...that the, that the chapter divisions are not in right. I, inerrant or inspired or infallible, what, what do we find? Right. Like, what, what would be going on there? Right. And again, just to paint the picture, right? Today, we can tell somebody, open up your Bibles to Revelation chapter 20. And then we can begin to give our view. 
Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, again, if you didn't have that, if if you just reading through Revelation, and you come to this new paragraph in Revelation, right? Is there anything there that would make the reader stop and say, "Okay, there's something grammatically or grammatically hinting to me, right, that we're starting another recapitulation, that that somehow we're not just going from what we just read at the end of chapter 19, we're not following this through to to the next thing sequentially, all right? So what we find in in what we know as Revelation chapter 20, verse 1, what we find is the typical Greek conjunction, chi. In fact, it's so common that it's used over 9,000 times in the New Testament. Uh, It's the only word, in fact, if I remember correctly from my Greek Days, the only word in the New Testament that's used more than the definite article. Uh, yeah, it's crazy, yeah, so, right? And, and you say, well, what does chi mean? Well, it typically is translated in our English versions as just the word end, A and D, right? I mean, it's a conjunction. It can also mean even. Uh, it can mean also. Uh, the, the context determines its exact sense. Okay, but the point is that nothing about chi suggests a change or that the author is beginning some other cycle or recapitulation. In fact, the normal way to take Kai would be that the author is continuing on with what they've been talking about. So Christ returns, right, second coming. He returns in chapter 19, and now we continue the story with whatever's coming next in chapter 20, right? Right, with, sequentially. That with it's Kai, right. Continuing. I mean, right, so... I'm not saying that the use of Kai to begin what we know as chapter 20, verse 1, means recapitulation can't be possible, okay? I, I'm just saying that there's nothing to make the reader think that that would be the case. And, and again, I hasten to say that I'm not saying that the entire book of Revelation is in strict chronological order, mm-hmm. all right? As if there's no overlap at all once you get beyond chapter 4 and especially with, with the three different sets of, of judgments, right? Right. Uh, so, uh, and, and I will also give this illustration. You know I like to come up with illustrations. Yeah, yeah. I don't claim they're all helpful. Uh, but listen, let, let's say you go to visit believers around the globe, especially in third world countries who pretty much only have Bibles as their resources, if they even have that. Sometimes you might have families or villages that have one complete Bible. Right. All right. So what I mean is, though, they don't have study Bibles. They don't have commentaries and such, okay? In that scenario, I hardly think you're going to find someone who's going to converse with you about the book of Revelation and say, oh, yeah, it's, it's a book that has seven repeating cycles, you know, uh, recapitulation. You know, it, it recapitulates the same time period, the church age, the inter-advent period, seven different times. Do you see my point? Yeah, oh yeah, right. They're not going to I'm not trying to be sarcastic here. I'm not trying to be funny. I'm just, uh, honestly. Yeah. You're not going to find that. All right, you can't get that from the text itself. Uh, In fact, you would never even think of that unless someone first planted the idea in your mind. Right, which shows the relationship between systematic theology and the Bible, right? Right. There's... Right, that's why we always stick Scripture first, systematic theology second. Yeah, that's right. Okay, now... Uh, it's kind of like when I mess around, you know, with my Pado baptist friends. You know, I, I always say to them, if someone asks you why you baptize infants, you can't tell them, well, go, just go read the Bible, and it'll be obvious. Mm-hmm. I can do that. If you say, how come you believe in believer's baptism? All I have to do is say, go read the Bible. Mm-hmm. Go read the Gospels, read Acts. You know, you can't do that, right, if you're Pado baptist uh, So, you know, and I think you always have to no matter what position you're dealing with, you always have to ask, if someone only had the Bible and they were never presented with any other idea or thought in their mind, would they come away with this? Right. Right? I think that's helpful because that lets us know if we need man's systems or books or understandings versus just the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. Right. You know, so one of the things I like to do often is is, is interact with... Uh, missionaries and keep up with missiology and what's going on and think about what are you finding around the world 
You know, like for instance, we've talked about this before, but it just, you know, plurality of elders for church singing. Mm-hmm. Well, that's all over the world, especially in third world countries. Why? Right. Because they haven't had Baptists come there and say, no, you know, you have to have, uh, uh, you know, like American Baptists, you know, we it's a democracy, man. You yeah, know, you have yeah. to have uh, deacons and just one pastor, and, and you, you don't have that because they have their Bibles. Complementarianism. They may not know the word. Right. But why don't you have women preachers in these places? Because they can read their Bible. Mm-hmm. It's only when somebody else comes and gives them these different ideas, right? Yeah. And that's really my point here. Yeah, no. So, it's good furthermore, stuff. furthermore, I'll show this in more detail in a few minutes. But even within uh, the idea of these cycles of recapitulation, we'll see that that can't be because then you would have some contradictions. Mm. And uh, I'll mention that in a little while. Yeah, that's a good thought. I mean, for the people that are, you know, we're trying to deal with the text, right? right? What does the text say? So, well, okay, yep. Snurdly says it's time for our sponsors. So today, we want to remind you that the Hammer Podcast is brought to you by the truth. It will outlive you. Mm, So as we get get into the specifics, you had mentioned that, you know, there's really two big specific exegetical issues, um, and it revolves around Satan being bound and the resurrection in Revelation 20. Yes, indeed. So let's begin just by reading Revelation chapter 20, all right, beginning in verse 1, and then we we can kind of see this and comment as we go through. All right. So Revelation 20 in verse 1, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit, or the abyss, and a great chain. And he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit, and shut it, and sealed it over him, so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a little while. Okay, now the amillennial view says that Satan is bound now. In other words, this will not occur in the future, because remember, we're in this thousand-year time frame, mm-hmm. right? Revelation 20 is just a recapitulation of this church age, this right. inner advent age, okay? So we're in it now. Therefore, they have to say that Satan is bound now. Then, of course, somebody comes along and says, wait, Satan can't be bound now because Peter says he roams around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may d- devour. Then the amillennialist retorts, well... The text actually sa- only says that he's, he's bound and that he can't deceive the nations. Mm. Now, in fairness, the text doesn't use the word, doesn't qualify him being bound by saying he's only bound. Okay? Mm-hmm. We don't read the words he's only bound. What we read is, again, verse 3, Revelation 20, threw him into the pit, shut it, and sealed it over him, listen, so that he might not deceive the nations any longer. Right. Okay. Purpose. Now, it specifically mentions that he, so that he might not deceive the nations. Okay. So they're going to take that uh, and they're really going to squeeze that. Right. Interestingly, they really want to take that literally. That is an interesting and point. Woodenly, literally, to say it. No, it only means that he can't deceive the nations any longer. Now, we'll talk about that in a little while. Like, what, what does that mean? What kind of limitations does that put on? Because that sounds to me wide open. Right. Uh, it sounds to me like he can deceive everyone and, you know, right? So, right. So anyway, so let's think about this for a moment. So currently in this age, the Amillennialist says that Satan is bound only with respect to deceiving the nations. Okay, now remember that the amillennialist has no choice but to say this, right? Because they maintain that we're currently living in a thousand-year kingdom church age, right? So they have to have Satan bound. Now, some amillennialists, whom I personally know, have been intellectually honest enough on this point that they say, yeah, I know it sounds like a stretch to say Satan is bound in the here and now, you know, but it's the best we have. Mm-hmm. Right, so... You, you mentioned Peter saying Satan is like a roaring lion roaming around looking for who, someone to devour. Right. And I guess the amillennialists will say, yes, he's doing that individually, but 
he's not doing that like at a corporate deception of the nation's right. standpoint. That's how they would right, which take they ha- what seems to be a clear passage in Peter. Yeah. Well, of course, they, they have to, to, to say that. Um, now, they have a couple problems here. You know, one is the deception issue, right? The, the other issue, which I'll get to in a moment, is, has to do with where Satan actually is. You know, is he actually bound up there? Is mm-hmm. that all just spiritual talk for us to picture him being bound in some way, but he's not really in an abyss uh, or something? Okay? Yeah, because if he was bound in the abyss, how could he leave it? Right, right, exactly. So, uh, so look, but, but it's very hard, I think, to differentiate what the difference is in deceiving individuals of a nation versus deceiving a nation. You know, I personally don't think John is telling us that Satan is only deceiving individually, but not nationally right now. Mm-hmm. His point seems to me to be that he is not, during the time he shall be bound, right? John's point seems to me to be that he will not be deceiving at all, anyone, Yeah. during that time, right? When John says nations, I think he just simply means all people, right? That's a way of saying everyone from, from all nations. Yeah. That, I mean, everyone, yeah, I mean, some, some, everyone on earth belongs to a nation somewhere. Right. I guess somebody might say, well, you know, out in Timbuktu, people groups we haven't met yet, they're not technically nations, you know, so Satan can deceive them. I mean, I, you know, uh, so I, I just think that that is a, a massive stretch. Yeah, to get to that point. Well, okay, so what are the, what are their exegetical issues are there with that idea? Right. Well, uh, th- there are many. First, let me just say the plain reading of the text would be against such a view, right? That the right. plain reading of the text would be that there's going to be some future time when Satan is is bound. Secondly, every time Scripture and, and this and, and this speaks. Uh, to the spatial issue, okay? Every time Scripture speaks of the bottomless pit or the abyss, it, it always means the actual place. In other words, to say that Satan is not actually spatially bound during this time in the abyss, but that it just gives us a picture mm-hmm. of him being bound, but he's not literally actually really bound there, it's not consistent with how the abyss is used elsewhere in Scripture. Nor would I say is it consistent with the language of the first three verses of Revelation 20, right? I mean, look, verse 2, he seized the dragon. We have a picture of somebody seizing a dragon. Now mm-hmm. you're telling me, wow, he really didn't seize them. It's just it's all just spiritually speaking, right? He, he didn't actually seize them. Uh, then it's, so he seized, he's bound. Well, he's not literally seized and, and bound. And then he threw him into the pit. Well, he's not really actually literally thrown into a pit, and then it is shut and sealed over him. Well, there's not really anything literally shut and sealed over him, right? You see what I'm saying? All yeah. of this language seems very uh, obvious to just take it at face value, right? But they don't want to take any of that at face value, uh, but they really want to stretch the do not deceive the nations and take that, yeah, that and, one and make is that the... as just something very specific. Which gets to, uh, you know, the, the next point, right? Third, I would say, beyond what Peter says, him being a roaring lion seeking whom, whom he may devour, the New Testament constantly talks about Satan's deceptive activity. Deception is what he does best. Mm-hmm. He's the deceiver. Yeah, the father of lies. Just think of our parables in Matthew 13. What does Jesus say about Satan? He's going to be sowing his seed right alongside. Right. Well, how can he do that? If he's chained up, well, again, they're going to come back and say, well, but he's not deceiving the nations. Yeah, he's doing it individually. Which, which right. is completely, I mean, let's that, uh, let's be honest and say that's laughable. Yeah, it seems like a stretch. Uh, well, it, it's a complete stretch. Yeah. Um, I mean, you, you know, we'll, we'll say a little bit more about this as we, uh, as, as we go down, but uh, it, it's just a stretch to suggest that somehow, right now, during this time, uh, Satan is is bound. All right, and and fourth, and this is just exe- this is just you know exegetical, maybe not exegetical, but 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 practical. Right? Can anyone say with a straight face that the nations of the world? All right, let's get let's hammer this for a moment. Can anyone say with a straight face the nations of the world have not been satanically deceived since Christ's first coming? So what were Hitler and the Third Reich? Hmm. 
if it wasn't Satan, what was it? Yeah. I mean, clearly they were deceived. And 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 if nations have not been deceived over 2,000 years, I would hate to see what it would be like if they were deceived by Satan. Yeah, yeah. If this is If this is as good as it gets... I mean, look, we live in a nation where there are actually some people who do not know the difference between a man and a woman. If that's not satanic deception... Yeah. I, I don't know what is. Well, I mean, they had they put satanic uh, idols up in one of the capitals, and then someone knocked it down, and it was a whole big thing. Yeah, you, yeah. You, you I mean, it's... Touch the... Uh, so it just doesn't... You know, somebody might chime in and say, well, no, they don't know the difference between a man and a woman because Revelation chapter 1, this is God handing them over, this is their... Uh, this is divine judgment, right? But how does God, d- d- God divinely judges people uh, by allowing them mm-hmm. to be deceived by the great deceiver? Saint. We even see that in Second Thessalonians chapter two. He makes it clear that that's part of the judgment on people that don't believe, right? So anyway, uh, so it's just it, it's it's pretty much an, an, an impossibility uh, exegetically, and then as we look out and, and look at things. And again, we don't want to ever view, we don't want to interpret Scripture from experience, but we can interpret experience from Scripture. Right, Clearly right. Satan uh, is alive and active and is not bound and chained up and in the abyss uh, right here and now in, in this age. Uh, now, fifthly, I should add that this causes issues. This this belief that Satan is bound up right now and can't deceive the nations causes issues with their with their own recapitulation theory. Because if you were to go to chapter 13 of Revelation, which would be a different cycle of recapitulation, but they would be say but they would say it's still speaking about the same time frame, the here and now, mm-hmm. the inter-advent period, right? You go to chapter 13 of Revelation beginning in verse 7 it says this. Also it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. Hmm. Okay, we're again we're talking about Satan his influence here and all authority was given over uh was given it over every tribe. Okay, this is talking about the beast. Every tribe and people and language and nation. Hmm. And all who dwell on earth will worship it everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book the life of the lamb who was slain. Okay, now how can anyone read that and see that in another as Satan deceiving the very nations that they say he he can't deceive? So, mm-hmm. uh, so clearly, it just it just doesn't line up. Yeah, I mean, it just you know, if we're taking a a look at the scripture, right? It sounds like the view that Satan is somehow only limitedly bound has a lot of problems. Right? It makes it it makes it hard for us to say, yeah, yeah, that's definitely what's happening here. Right, that's a serious exegetical problem. And again, most amillennialists know that. Right. So, uh, just you know, can, can't can't be held up with scripture. And again, I want to stress in this series, I'm gonna you know we're we're just dealing with pure exegesis here. We want to know what scripture says. So I'm gonna take the pre mill to task after this. I mean, we're gonna take, you know, we're not getting paid. Yeah, yeah, that's right. By uh, our sponsor's truth. That's right. We're not that's getting right. paid by any particular source here, so we just want what what does what does Scripture say? Yeah, yeah. That's so we need to be honest with the text. Right. What does the text say? And that's right. where we want to go. So as we as we keep keep with the text, um, the next exegetical challenge that the amillennialists have yep. in Revelation twenty. Yeah, this is equally uh, as as difficult. Uh, so, you know, this would, uh, again, remember, uh, ex- they're going to say that Revelation 20 begins a final of the seven cycles, right? Well, some important things here, all right? Binding of Satan 1, we just talked about it. Second point here uh, for the amillennialist is how do we take this resurrection that is mentioned in Revelation chapter 20? And I just want to read... We'll read verses 4 through 6. Yeah, good. Okay? So let's read this. Then I saw thrones, and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. 
They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. Okay, now, we all know what a resurrection is, right? It means to be resurrected. Mm -hmm. You were dead, and now you're alive. Right. Physically, right? We're talking about a, a, a physical resurrection here, all right? Right. Now, the amillennialist wants to change the meaning of resurrection here to mean regeneration. Okay, let me say that again. The amillennialist wants to change the meaning of resurrection here to regeneration. Mm. In other words, they deny that this is speaking of an actual physical resurrection at all. They say, no, it's really a spiritual resurrection. It, it, it really means regeneration, someone becoming saved. Right, So you ask, well, what exactly is the spiritual re resurrection? And they'll say, it's when someone becomes saved. Right, it's, it's, it's when they're regenerated. Now, of course, Scripture has a word that we can translate as regeneration that's used elsewhere in the New Testament. So certainly the Holy Spirit could have used that word here if that's what he meant. But right. he doesn't use that. He uses the typical word uh, for resurrection. Now, interestingly... Uh, all millennialists will are aware, and, and they will admit that uh, anastasis, right, the word for resurrection, always means an actual real resurrection in the New Testament, an actual real physical resurrection in the New Testament. But they will say that this is the one time where it is used in a very remarkable way, in a way that it's not used anywhere outside of Scripture. Hmm. And most importantly, in Scripture, they'll say here it is used in a remarkable way, a way that it's not used anywhere else, and that it actually doesn't mean physical resurrection, but someone becoming saved, i.e. regeneration. In fact, you know, one amillennialist, Ken Gentry, he, he says this. He says, putting faith in Christ would be the first resurrection, hmm. a spiritual resurrection. So he says putting faith in Christ— Becoming saved. Right. That's the first resurrection. Right, that's what they want to say here. Now, I'll just add as a bonus a little-known point here, and that is that some older amillennialists, not, not all amillennialists through the ages uh, have has said this, because they realize that's just not tenable. Mm -hmm. Clearly, it means physical resurrection, right? They also realize that they're handing over a weapon to you know liberals and those who don't want to believe the gospel who want to say, well, Jesus wasn't actually physically resurrected. Yeah, it was just a spiritual Right, because they uh, say, well, wait life. a minute, no, it's, yeah, right, it's, it, yeah, right, it's, see, you, you've proven it can be used that way. Right. Therefore, Therefore when it talks here, about Jesus. it can be used, mm -hmm. you know, right? It, it doesn't have to be, so you, you get the point. But, so there are some older amillennialists of yesteryear that what they would do here, because they still can't have it be a physical resurrection, right, or blows their view up, so what, what they would do... Uh, and I think it's 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 equally dubious, but they they wouldn't claim that resurrection here means regeneration, but they would say that it speaks of the believer's entrance into the intermediate state at the point of death. So when they die, right? Which obviously, if you just think about that long enough, it really doesn't make any sense, right? So, and again, no one reading this text would ever think that resurrection means anything other than resurrection, unless it had to mean something else because it conflicts with their system, right? Right? And that's where, again, I don't care what theological point we're talking about. That's where we have to be honest enough to say, no, I will not bend Scripture to fit my system yeah, or to fit my belief here, there, whatever it is. Yeah. Right? Which might make you a theological orphan, right? Because well, you're not will. loyal to one system. Right. No, it will, yeah. Right. You know, it makes it hard to get, if, if you're a scholar, it makes it hard to get anything published. Mm -hmm. uh, it makes it hard to certainly get a contract or write a commentary. It, it makes it hard sometimes even to get hired at a school to teach or something, because it's like, you know, this school, now nah, you have to be on mill. Right. Uh, you have to be post mill for this school. Not, you have to be pre mill here, yeah. right? You, you know, so it does it does make you an orphan. Yeah. Okay, well let's let's just to reiterate, why yeah. can't the amillennialists take at face value and say that the resurrection here mm -hmm. in Revelation 20 yeah. 
is an actual physical resurrection. Yeah, right, right, exactly. So, well, they can't have two physical resurrections, right? They can't have one physical resurrection in verse 4 of chapter 20 and then have another physical resurrection uh, in some form in verses 11 through 15 when it's dealing with the great white throne judgment, right? And here's why. Because the problem they have is that you would have two physical resurrections separated by a thousand years. Well, they can't have that because they maintain we're in that thousand-year time period right now. Right. So they can't have that. So this is why they can't have Satan being bound and verse 4 actually meaning a physical resurrection. Yeah, so. that's good. Yeah, that's a good point. All so. right, yes. Okay, so I got Snurdly over here. And he is, uh, that's right, that's right. Okay, it's, oh, it's time, time for it's the time. Uh, Inquisition. All right, I'm going to turn here into our vault. And, uh, okay, oh, wow. All right, yeah, we got some good ones in here. These are, I think, this one actually, yes, this one I have here in my formerly East Coast wing-stained fingers looks to be hot off the press. Um, so... On Sunday, we had talked about the three different judgments that the Bible speaks of. Yes, yes. And you had brought up that there's actually, uh, what should we say, against the common understanding, possibly, yeah. in the evangelical world, there are actually degrees of suffering sure, in yes. hell. Yeah. Um, could you explain how you got there? That The question was, you know... How, how do we understand, how do we know that there's degrees of suffering in hell? Yeah. Um, because this person thought that, sure, you know, you're only, you only go to hell for the one sin of not believing in Jesus. Yeah. So they didn't understand that fully. Yeah, so a couple things. Well, uh, you know, first of all, let's, before I answer the actual question, let me deal with the last thing you said, right? So, so there are some people that will say, well, everyone that is in hell is only in hell the reasoning goes like this. They're only in hell for rejecting Christ. You know, Jesus' death on the sin paid for all their other sins. Right. Okay, well, th there's an error in the thinking right there. Like, you can't just say, well, Jesus is... You can't have a form of universalism, right? Like, Jesus' death on the cross paid for every sin but that. Right. Well, I, where number one, there's nothing in the Bible that says that. Mm -hmm. Number two, think about what you're saying. Now you're saying his death is powerful enough to do 99% of the job, right? I mean, his, his death is powerful enough that it covers every sin as our substitute except for that one. Mm -hmm. it, it just doesn't, it, it, it doesn't hold water um, at all. In fact, if you, uh, if you really extrapolate that out, that's where you understand that you know, his death— on the cross, uh, was actually obviously paid for a a specific group mm -hmm. of people, but that's another question for another time. Yeah, another but, another but question for the... that's right. But let's get into the actual the, the the degrees of hell. Okay, number one, there there have has to be before we even look at the text. There has to be because Jesus dishes out perfect justice. Everyone, every unbeliever, has a different different sins they committed in their lives, mm -hmm. a different number of them, a different amount. Different quality of they, them. They've turned down uh, a certain amount of light. They've rejected a certain amount of light. You know, somebody growing up in America, hearing the gospel over and over versus somebody in Timbuktu, uh, right? Uh, so, they, so just the fact that God dishes out perfect justice, that can only be done if there are varying justices handed out, right? If there are varying sentences, if there are varying degrees of suffering. Mm -hmm. If everybody suffered the exact same, then that would, that's not each person getting their due, right? Right. So, so which would mean then that God was not just. Right. In his distribution right. of Right. And judgment. that means that you never get actual perfect justice. Mm hmm. In this world or the next. We know we don't get it in this world, right? Yeah. Now, let's go to the text, which is ultimately what matters. And in Revelation chapter 20, it's very clear, right? It is plural there. They're judged according to their deeds. They're judged according to their works. Even the ESV is is plural, but it's in our English rendering when we read it, 
we don't see it as clearly, but it said, you know, they're, they're judged based on what they had done. Mm-hmm. But the had done there is translating the, uh, it's translating the plural. So the key there is that it's plural. So it's clearly each person is judged based on their works, their deeds, right? right? What, what, what they did uh, in their lives, the sins they committed in their lives. Yeah, plurally. Okay, well, and then, you know, what comes to my mind is when Jesus says, it'll be worse for you than it'll be worse for you than it was for Sodom and Gomorrah on that day, the day of judgment, which seems to imply that there would be a tear, right, of judgment that Sodom and Gomorrah got it bad, but for you... Who've had it's all this be even light? Worse. Right, and that gets back to the light I just yeah, said. Right, right, exactly. That's why he says that. And and you know uh, what goes along with this also is a great misconception in the evangelical world today that sin is sin is sin is sin. Yeah, that, that every sin is is equally as bad or depraved. Now, now all sin w- will keep someone uh, from from Christ. Right, mm-hmm. uh, all sin can can block us. Right. From God, even for the believer, right? It doesn't change our relationship. Sin doesn't change our relationship with Christ. We're in a saving relationship, but it messes up our fellowship with Him, right? Yeah. First John talks about that. Uh, but so, so for an unbeliever, you know, any sin, right, separates you from God. However, the, some sins are more depraved, mm-hmm. which we see in Romans one. We see it in Romans one. We see yeah. it in the fact that Jesus says, right? Uh, I think it's in the Gospel of John. It, it, the, it escapes me right now, but the exact reference, what Jesus said, you know, you, you're you're guilty of greater sin. Yes, right. Okay, so so there's a great misconception today among people that sin is sin that is sin, right? That that's why, for instance, heterosexual sin mm-hmm. is bad and wrong, but it is not as depraved as homosexual sin because one is natural, one is unnatural. Both are sinful, both are wrong. Mm-hmm. Okay? Don't misunderstand me. But one is unnatural, which right. is exactly what Romans 1 is saying, by the way, and is therefore more depraved. Okay? So the fact that some sin is greater than others, more depraved than others, uh, is another reason that calls for these these degrees of hell. Right, the degrees, the different the different sentencings. Right. Yeah, and I think maybe the hang up is that cuz it's a prominent you know, the guys that are popular in evangelical culture want to say all the time that all sins are equal, that there's no tier, right, of yeah. some sins are worse than others, which you know, it, that's an odd thing for well, people you know, to say, right. but it's and common, some, right? And they might want to stay. They might be in some cases. You're trying to distance yourself from the Roman Catholic false view of venial versus mortal sins, okay? right? But that's not what we're talking about. We're just, we're just talking about scripture, right? But according to scripture, no question, some sin is more depraved and worse than other sin, right? And by the way, we live in light of that all the time, right? Right? I, do pastors sin? Yeah, right. Yeah, I mean. Do, it's, are they disqualified because they commit any sin? Right. No. As if, as not. if, as if you're in a level, as if you've reached a state of perfection. No. Right. But some sin is deemed as disqualifiable. Why? Right. Because, because it's, it's right. Yeah. Enough of a higher. Of so a that higher right level. there, there's our illustration. I mean, so we we live that way practically all the time. Do do we throw people in jail uh, for? You know, we throw people in jail, right? Well, we should put people in jail for... No, no, jail's yeah, bad. Right. Jail's for, mean. For murder, right? Uh, grand larceny, right? Yeah. You know, things like that. You know, do we throw people in jail for littering? You know, mm-hmm. maybe in some places they do, right? But typically not. Do, do we throw people in jail for going five mile per hour over the speed limit? Yeah. You know, so right? So, I mean... Well, and even you go to the Old Testament where not all... You could have a, a murder that was an accident... Right, right, Mans- yeah, manslaughter. We would, manslaughter. we would call it manslaughter, yeah. but they would have city of refuge, right, right, for those people, which is different than if I willfully 
with intent, set out to take right, someone's life. Right, exactly. So once we begin to talk about this, it becomes obvious, and it's like, oh yeah, well of course some things are more grievous, you know, than others, and heinous, and yeah. So uh, it's just a matter of just sitting down, listening to this, and thinking about a little bit of scripture, and then I think it straightens our thoughts out on that. Yeah, no, that's good. That's good. All right. Well, that brings us to a close. We will see you in a hundred and sixty-eight hours. hours.